Our Teaching, 1998, Islam International Publications Limited. Our Teachings is an abridged version of the teachings of the holy founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Hulam Ahmad of Ghadian, the Promised Messiah, and Mahdi, as laid down in his book, Gishti Nu, Noah's Ark. Publisher's Note Our Teaching is the English translation of a portion of the Urdu book, Gishti Anu, parentheses, Noah's Ark, published in 1902 and written by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Ghadian, India. Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed claimed that he was the promised Messiah and Mahdi, whose advent had been foretold by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. His mission was to revive the original and pristine teachings of Islam as enunciated in the Holy Quran and as explained by the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, in the Hadith. Our teaching, therefore, contains nothing but a gist of the teachings from the above two sources. Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad founded the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat in 1889 under express divine guidance for the Renaissance of Islam. He invited Muslims in particular and all members of the human race in general to join it, stating that this was the path of salvation. That is why he entitled the complete book Noah's Ark, meaning that those who wanted to be saved from the deluge of irreligion and materialism should enter into the fold of the community. Our teaching was addressed primarily to members of the community for their moral and spiritual education. Its contents, however, are so soul-inspiring that every soul in search of spiritual upliftment can derive benefit from it. We wish to point out that one chapter, entitled Our Beliefs, has been added to the original booklet. This is an extract from Invitation to Ahmadiyya, written by Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad, second successor to the Promised Messiah, Allah Salatu Wasalam. Since its original publication, our teaching has been translated in various languages of the world and has gone through many editions. The present edition is being presented by Islam International Publications Limited. Forward. This is a time when the darkness of materialism has overspread the entire face of the earth and obscured people's vision. Many there are who profess faith but are deprived of its true sweetness and strength. They are unaware of the one living, omnipresent God. For the benefit of seekers after truth, therefore, I present an abridged version of the teaching of the holy founder of the Ahmadiyya movement as laid down in his book, Gishti Nu, parentheses, Noah's Ark, which he wrote to save men from the current deluge of irreligion and materialism. This book was intended mainly for the members of the Ahmadiyya community, but Muslims in general have also been addressed in it. The book is a torch of guidance through which every Muslim, nay, every man with a craving for truth and spirituality can rekindle his inner lamp and illuminate his heart. The present abridgment is an English rendering of the Founder's own sacred words, and therefore is replete with all the blessings that descend from heaven on the heart of a holy person. Read it and be blessed. A list of words, mostly terms of Islamic theology, is added at the end with a brief explanation, which I hope will be of some facility to the foreign reader. Mirza Bashir Ahmed, Rava, September 22, 1958. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Nahmadahu wa nusalli ala Rasulihil Karim. Our teachings. Let it be absolutely clear that a mere verbal pledge has no value if it is not supported by a genuine and firm resolve to live up to it in every way. Therefore, whoever fully lives up to my teachings, he alone enters that house of mine, with reference to which God Almighty has promised. Inni o hafazo gulla manfiddar. I shall myself protect all those who are in this house. It should not, however, be understood here that this divine protection is extended only to those living within the compass of my house, made of mud and bricks. The pledge also encompasses those who follow my teachings to the fullest extent, and who, therefore, can truly be said to be the inmates of my spiritual house. Relevant to a proper observance of my teaching, it is essential that one should firmly believe that there is an all-powerful, all-sustaining, supreme being, the creator of everything, changeless, everlasting, and eternal. He does not beget, nor was he begotten. He is holy, 
so that there is no need or occasion for him to go on the cross or suffer in any way or be subject to death. He is such that being far removed, he is still very near, and being very near, he is still very far. Although he is one and absolutely unique, his manifestations are diverse and multifarious. Whenever there occurs in man a new change, for the changed man he becomes a new god. Dealing with him on the basis of a fresh manifestation, the man witnessing a change in God, in proportion to the change in himself, not that there occurs any change in God, he being eternal, changeless, and most perfect in himself, but with every change in man, for the better. God also reveals himself to be in a fresh and clear manifestation. With every progressive effort on the part of man, God also shows himself with higher and more powerful manifestation. He displays an extraordinary manifestation of his power and glory, only when man shows an extraordinary change in himself, this being the root and the bedrock basis of the marvels and miracles witnessed at the hands of all servants of God. Belief in this God, with these powers, is the foremost essential condition of our movement. Inculcate this belief in your hearts, giving to its implications and requirements the first and topmost priority over all considerations of self, over its comforts and relationships. By means of actions in the field of your daily life, with unflinching courage, show a steadfast loyalty in his way. Others in this world do not give him preference over material means and the support they hope to get from their friends and relations. But do you give him the first place so that in heaven you should come to be reckoned his people? To show signs of grace is the eternal way of God. But you can partake of this blessing only when there remains no difference and no distance between him and you. Only when all your wishes, hopes, and desires merge into his will. Only when at all times, in success or failure, in hope or disappointment, you remain in humble prostration at his door, so that he should do with you what he will. If you act like this, in you would appear that God, who for a long time has kept his face concealed from the world. Is there any among you, then, who would act upon this teaching, seeking only his pleasure, without the slightest sense of dissatisfaction against the way his will works? Even in distress, you should put your best foot forward, for this is the secret of your success, and you should strive to the utmost of your power to spread the idea of his singleness and unity all over the earth. Be kind and merciful to humanity, for all are his creatures. Do not oppress them with your tongue or hands or in any other way. Always work for the good of mankind. Never unduly assert yourselves with pride over others, even those who are placed under you. Never use abusive language for anyone, even though he abuses you. Be humble in spirit, kind and gentle and forgiving, sympathetic towards all and wishing them well, so that you should be accepted. There are many who pretend to be kind, gentle, and forgiving, but inside they are wolves. There are many on outside who look pure, but in their hearts they are serpents. You cannot be accepted in the presence of the Lord unless you are pure, both on outside and inside. If you are big, have mercy for those who are small, not contempt. If you are wise and well-versed in learning, serve the ignorant with words of wisdom. Never desire to bring disgrace on their ignorance by trying to show off your own learning. If you are rich, instead of treating them with self-centered, disdainful pride, you should serve the poor. Beware of the paths of destruction. Fear the Lord. Be righteous. Do not fall in worship before the creation of God. Turn wholly and solely to Him, so that you lose interest in this world. Become entirely His, living wholly for His will and pleasure, for His sweet sake, hating everything impure and sinful. For indeed He is holy. Every morning should be a witness for you that you spent the night with righteousness, and every evening should be a witness for you that you went through the, the day with fear. The holy prophet is a seal of prophets. In point of belief, all that God desires from you is just this, that you hold that God is one, and that Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is his prophet, Khatam al-Anbiya, the greatest of them all. After him, there is to be no other prophet except one who shall be given the mantle of Muhammadiyat as Baruz, since the servant is not separated from his master, nor a branch, 
different from its roots. Be perfectly sure that Jesus, son of Mary, is dead, his grave being in Kashmir, Sarangar, Mohalla, Khanyar. God has spoken of his death in the Holy Quran. It should also be borne in mind that I in no way seek to deny the eminence of Jesus, peace be upon him. Though God has conveyed me that the Muhammadi Messiah stands higher in rank than the Mosaic Messiah, I hold the Messiah, son of Mary, in great respect, since from the spiritual point of view I am the Khathamul Khalafa. In Islam, as Messiah, the son of Mary was the Khathamul Khalafa in the Israelite chain. In the Mosaic Dispensation, the son of Mary was the promised Messiah. While I am the promised Messiah of the dispensation of Muhammad, I therefore hold him in great esteem, whose name I bear. And whoever says that I do not respect him is a great liar and a mischief maker. Who belongs to my community and who does not? Having explained all these things, I repeat once more that you must not rest satisfied merely because in outward form you have taken the bath in my hand. The outward form means nothing. God sees what lies inside your heart, and he would deal with you on the basis of what he sees there. Lo and behold, I hear and discharge my duty unto you by making it plain that sin is a poison. Do not take it. Disobedience to God is a dirty death which you should avoid. Turn to prayer that you should get the strength. At the time of prayer, if a man does not firmly believe that Allah has power over everything, except what may be contained in a previous promise, such a person is not of my community. He who is caught in the tangle of worldly greed and never even raises his eyes to things which pertain to the next life is not of my community. Whosoever does not wholly and completely keep away from every sin and every evil action, like wine, gambling, looking lustfully at women, dishonesty, bribes, and from every kind of illegal gratification, he is not of my community. Whoever is not constantly turning to prayer and does not remember him in absolute humility of spirit, he is not of my community. Whosoever does not give up association with a bad companion who exercises an unhealthy influence over him, he is not of my community. Whosoever does not respect his parents, whosoever does not render obedience to them in things which do not run counter to the Holy Quran, and whosoever is neglectful in rendering to them the service to which they are undoubtedly entitled, he is not of my community. Whosoever does not live with his wife and her relations with gentleness, goodness, and magnanimity, he is not of my community. Whosoever deprives his neighbor of the very least good in his power, he is not of my community. Whoever has no wish to forgive the faults of those who may have transgressed against him and desires to nurse malice, he is not of my community. Every man or woman who is dishonest towards his or her spouse is not of my community. Whosoever in any way violates the pledge he took at my hand at the time of bath is not of my community. Whosoever does not really hold me to be the promised Messiah, he is not of my community. Whosoever is not prepared to obey me in all things known to be good and accepted, he is not of my community. And whosoever, as a habit, sits among those who are hostile towards me, falling into tacit and silent agreement with them, he is not of my community. Every adulterer, debauch, drunkard, murderer, thief, gambler, dishonest person, bribe-taker, usurper, oppressor, tyrant, liar, forger, and associate of these, and whoever brings false accusations and scandal against his brothers and sisters, he is not of my community unless he fully repents of his misdeeds and totally breaks away from bad associates, turning a new leaf. Indeed, all these things are poisons. You cannot partake of them and live, for light and darkness cannot exist together. Whosoever has a crooked nature and is not open and above board with God, he cannot partake of the blessing which comes to those pure of heart. Indeed, very fortunate are they who cleanse their hearts, washing away all impurities, and who make a pledge of loyalty with their God, for they shall never come to naught. It is not possible that God should disgrace them, they being of God and God of them. They shall be saved from all tribulations. Extremely foolish, indeed, is he who should try to harm them, for verily they are in the lap of God, who is ever ready to support them. Who has yielded belief to God? Verily, only those who are as such described above. Similarly, he also is foolish, who is anxious about a bold sinner, evil and full of mischief inside his heart, 
for he himself would be destroyed. From the day God created this heaven and earth, it has never happened that he destroyed those who were good. On the contrary, for the sake of such as these, he has always shown great marvels and will show even now. Our God possesses great and wonderful powers. Our God is a very loyal God, and for those who remain loyal to him, he shows wonderful works. The world wishes to tear them to pieces and to eat them up, and every enemy grinds his teeth on them. But he who is their friend saves them from any danger and brings them out triumphant on every field. How fortunate then is he who does not let go of his hold of such a God. To him we render our faith and him we have recognized. Of all the world he is alone and is the God who has sent down his revelation on me, who, for me, has shown powerful signs, who has sent me down as the promised Messiah for this age. There is no God whatsoever except him, in heaven nor on earth. Whosoever does not yield faith to him, he remains deprived of the good, deprived of blessings, and deprived of succor. From our God we have received revelation that shines like the sun. We have seen that he alone is the God of the whole world, and there is no other God. How powerful indeed is the God we have found, and how sustaining! And how great, how wonderful are the qualities of the God we have seen! The truth is that for him there is nothing impossible, except what runs counter to his own book and his own promise. Therefore, when you pray to him, you should not be like those ignorant naturalists who have formed a natural law of their own which does not bear the stamp of God, for they are the rejected ones whose prayers will never be accepted. They are blind, not gifted with vision. They are dead, not alive. They put before God a law shaped by themselves, and they put limitations of their own on his powers, holding him weak and helpless beyond those limitations. Naturally, they would be dealt with in the light of their own condition. But when you stand up for prayer, it is incumbent on you to hold that your God has power over all things. Only then shall your prayer be accepted, and you shall witness those marvels of the power of your God, which we have witnessed. And remember, our witness is not on the basis of hearsay. It is on the basis of things we have seen ourselves. How can the prayers of one be accepted who does not hold that God has power over all things? And how can such a person in himself have the courage to pray to God over matters where the desired remedy or change would involve an infringement of the laws of nature as he understands them? But, O oh, you good person, your God is he who, without any pillars underneath, has hung up the countless stars in space, and who created the earth and the heavens absolutely from naught. Dost thou hold that in regard to thy need he will prove to be helpless? The fact is that thy own misconception will keep thee deprived of blessings. There are innumerable wonderful things in our God, but these are witnessed only by those who become his in all sincerity and faithfulness. He does not reveal those wonders to those who do not have faith in his powers, and who are not faithful and true. How unfortunate, indeed, is the man who does not even know that he has one God with power over all things. Our paradise, indeed, is our God. Our highest delight is in our God, for we have seen him and have found every beauty in him. This wealth is worth having, even if at the cost of one's life. This ruby is worth purchasing, though one may have to lose one's life to acquire it. O ye who are bereft, run to this fountain, and it will satiate your thirst. It is the fountain of life that will save you. What shall I do, and how am I to impress this glad tiding upon the minds? By what drum shall I make the announcement that this is your God, so that people might hear? What remedy shall I apply to their ears so the curses that the world might heap on you? Such curses melt in the air like smoke. They cannot turn day into night. What you should be afraid of is the curse that comes from God, which totally uproots from both the worlds, those on whom it falls. You cannot save yourselves with hypocrisy and pretense, because your God, who is your Lord, can see to the innermost depths of your being. How, then, can you hope to deceive him? Therefore, strengthen yourself and cleanse yourself to become pure and precious without a particle of dross anywhere in your being, or if there be any such, it will take away your light. And if any corner of your heart there be pride, empty pretense, hypocrisy, vanity, love of self, or laziness of disposition, you do not amount to anything acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Take care that on the basis of a thing or two, which you think you have accomplished, 
you do not fall into the delusion that you have done all that needed to be done. For God desires that your entire life, your whole being, should undergo a deep and thorough revolution. Indeed, he demands from you that you accept a death after which he would have given you another life. Immediately compose all your differences and make peace among yourselves. Forgive the transgressions of your brothers, for indeed he is evil who is not willing to make peace with his brother. He would be cut off, for he tries to create disruption. Leave off vanity and emphasis on self and all mutual resentments, all unpleasantness. Though truthful and justified in your stand, be humble in your demeanor as though you were in the wrong, so that you yourself should be treated with forgiveness. Leave off everything which fattens your vanity, for the door you have been invited to enter is not one that would admit a fat person. How unfortunate is the man who fails to yield belief to things, coming from the mouth of God, which I have stated to you. If at all you desire that God in heaven be pleased with you, hasten to become one among yourselves, as though you were brothers born of the same mother. Only he is most honored among you who forgives the transgressions of his brother. And unfortunate is he who remains obdurate and does not forgive. He is not part of me, and he has no share with me. Remain in great fear of the curse of God, for he is holy, intensely jealous, and particular in his holiness. An evildoer cannot win nearness to him. No one who is proud can win his nearness, nor the oppressor and unjust, nor one who is dishonest, nor anyone who is not jealous for his name. Those who fall on worldly benefits like dogs or ants, or vultures falling blindly on carrion, those who have only sought comfort in life, they cannot win nearness to him. Every impure eye remains far removed from him. Every impure heart remains unaware of him. For him, whoever lives in fire, shall be saved from the flames. He who weeps for his sake shall be made happy, full of laughter and jubilance. He who breaks away from this world for his sake shall find him. With the deepest sincerity of heart, with a steadfast strength, and stride to become the friends of God, so that he too should become your friend. Show mercy to your subordinates. Be kind to your spouses and to your brethren who are poor, so that in heaven you too will be received with mercy. You really and truly become his, so that he too should be yours. This world is a place of thousands of evils, tribulations and trials. In all sincerity and steadfastness of heart catch hold of God so that he keeps these evils, tribulations, and trials away from you. No evil and no distress takes its birth on this earth without a decree from heaven to that effect, and no distress is lifted until mercy descends from heaven. Therefore, wisdom on your part lies in this, that you take firm hold of the root, without worrying about the branches. It is not forbidden unto you to have recourse to remedies or plan with human endeavor. What is forbidden is that you place your entire reliance on them. In all circumstances, it is God's will that will be done, and for one who has the power to take his stand on this point, the position of faith in and reliance on God is the best of all positions. Those who do honor to the Holy Quran shall be honored in heaven. For you, another very essential teaching is this that you do not leave the Holy Quran like a book that has been forsaken, since it is therein and nowhere else that your life lies. Those who do honor to this holy book shall be honored in heaven. Those who will hold the holy Quran superior to every tradition and every other saying shall be given preference in heaven. For mankind now, all over the surface of the earth, there is no book except the holy Quran. For the sons of man, there is no messenger and no mediator except Muhammad. May peace and blessings of God be upon him. So strive that you cherish the purest love for this prophet of power and glory giving no one else any kind of preference over him, so that you be put down in heaven as those who have been saved. And very clearly, bear in mind that salvation is not something that you experience in the life after death. The real and true salvation is only that which shows its light in this very life. Who is saved? Only he who maintains a firm faith that the living God is a reality, and that Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, is a mediator between him and mankind, that under the skies there is no one equal to him in rank and elevation, nor any book to rival the Holy Quran, that for no one else did God wish that he should live forever, but for this blessed prophet he did so wish, that to keep him alive forever he laid the foundation for continuing the benefit of his sharia, 
and his spiritual blessings to the day of resurrection. And at long last, from the flow of his spiritual benefits for mankind, he sent the promised Messiah to this world, whose advent was indispensable for the completion of structure of Islam. For it was necessary that this world should not come to an end before the movement of Muhammad was given the color of the spiritual Messiah, the same as was given to the movement of Moses. This is what the following verse of the Holy Quran points to, namely, <laughs> Moses received the treasure which had been lost by the earlier ages, and Muhammad received the treasure which the movement of Moses had been unfortunate enough to lose. Now the movement of Muhammad stands in the place of the movement of Moses, but such that in grandeur, the like of Moses exceeds him a thousand times while the like of the Messiah in the movement of Muhammad excels Jesus by a thousand measures. And not only did the promised Messiah of the Muhammadi movement came, in terms of time, exactly in the 14th century, after the Holy Prophet, as Jesus had appeared 14 centuries after Moses, he also came at a time when the conditions of the Muslims of the day was identical with the Jews of the time of Jesus. Therefore, I am that promised Messiah, and no one else. Whoever enters into sincere bath with me and becomes my follower from the bottom of his heart, as to be engrossed in his obedience to me, as to forsake all of his personal aims and intentions, he alone is the one for whom in these days of great distress my soul shall desire to intercede. So all ye people counted as members of my community. In heaven you shall be counted members of my following only when in truth you actually begin to advance on the paths of righteousness. Offer your five daily obligatory prayers with such concentration and awe of mind as though you were seeing God in front of you with your physical eyes. Observe the days of fasting for the sake of God in full sincerity. All among you who are liable for zakat should never fail to discharge this important obligation. And those on whom the pilgrimage to Mecca has become obligatory without any obstacle standing in the way, should duly undertake that blessed journey. Do all good deeds with the proper care they deserve, forsaking evil from a real repulsion rising in the heart. Be very, very sure that no action whatsoever can take you to God if it is devoid of the righteousness of heart. The root of everything good is taqwa, fear of God. In whatever action this root is not lost, that action will never be devoid or futile. It is necessary, too, that you be tried by being thrown into diverse griefs and distresses, even as those before you were tried. Be, therefore, forewarned lest you stumble when the time came. The earth, with everything in it, can inflict no injury on you, provided your contract with heaven is firm. Whenever any injury comes to you, it will come only from your own hands. If all your honor on this earth is lost to you, God will give you an honor in heaven, that shall never wane. Therefore, do not leave him, whatever you may have to go through. You are bound to be persecuted in diverse ways, and many of your hopes will be denied to you. But in such cases, you should not grieve. For the Lord your God shall put you through trials to test whether or not you remain firm. If you desire that the angels in heaven should sing your praises, then take the beating many people shall give you, and rejoice. Hear abuse and give thanks to the Lord. Experience disappointments, but do not break away from him. You are the last people of God. Practice the good to an extent where it reaches its highest perfection. Everyone among you who relaxes and becomes lazy shall be thrown out of the community, as a dirty thing is discarded and thrown out. He shall die with regret in his heart, and he will not be able to injure God in any way. Lo and behold, with great joy I convey to you the glad tidings that your God does indeed really exist. Although all are his creatures, but he selects only those who select him. He himself comes to whosoever goes to him. He bestows honor upon those who honor him. After you have straightened your hearts and purified your tongues and your eyes and ears, you come to him. Amadea beliefs. 1. We believe that God exists, and to assert his existence is to assert a most important truth. 2. We believe that God is one without an equal in heaven or in earth. Everything else is his creation, dependent on him and his subsistence. He is without son or daughter or father or mother or wife or brother. He is one and unique. 3. We believe that God is holy, free from all imperfections and possessed of all perfections. There is no imperfection which may be found in him and no perfection which may not be found in him. His power and knowledge are unlimited. He encompasses everything and there is nothing which encompasses him. 
He is the first, the last, the manifest, the hidden, the creator, the master. He is the loving, the enduring. His actions are willed, not constrained or determined. He rules today as he ever ruled before. His attributes are eternal. 4. We believe that angels are a part of God's creation. As the Quran has it, angels do what they are bidden to do. They have been created in his wisdom to carry out certain duties. Their existence is real and references to them in the holy book are not metaphoric. They depend on God as do all men and all other creatures. 5. We believe that God speaks to his chosen servants and reveals to them his purpose. Revelation comes in words. Man lives by revelation and through it comes to have contact with God. The words in which revelation comes are unique in their power and wisdom. Their wisdom may not be revealed at once. A mind may be exhausted, but not for the wisdom of revelation. Revelation brings us to divine ordinances, laws, and exhortations. It also brings us knowledge of the unseen and of important spiritual truths. It conveys to us the approval of God, as well as his disapproval and displeasure, his love as well as his warnings. God communicates with man through revelation. The communications vary with circumstances and with the recipients. Of all divine communications, the most perfect, the most complete, the most comprehensive is the Quran. The Holy Quran is to last forever. It cannot be superseded by any future revelation. 6. We also believe that when darkness prevails in the world and man sinks deep in sin and evil, it becomes difficult for him to rise again without the help of God. Then, out of his mercy and beneficence, God chooses one of his own loving, loyal servants, charges him with the duty to lead and guide other men. As the Quran says, not a people, but have had a warner sent to them. God has sent messengers to every people. Through them, God has revealed his will and his purpose. Those who turn away from them ruin themselves. Those who turn to them earn the love and pleasure of God. 7. We also believe that divine messengers belong to different spiritual ranks and contribute in different degrees to the fulfillment of the ultimate divine design. The greatest of all messengers is the Holy Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace and the blessings of God. He is the chief of all man, messenger to them all. The revelation he received was addressed to all mankind. The whole of this earth was a mosque for him. Time came when his message spread to the lands and climbs beyond Arabia. People forsook gods of their own conception and began to believe in the one and the only God that the Holy Prophet Muhammad taught them to believe. The coming of the Holy Prophet marked an unparalleled spiritual revolution. Justice began to reign instead of injustice, kindness instead of cruelty. If Moses and Jesus had existed in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, they would have had to believe in him and had to follow him. 8. We also believe that God hears our prayers and helps us out of difficulties. He is a living God, His living character being evident in all things at all times. God continues His benevolent interest in His servants and His creatures. When they need His help, He turns to them with His help. If they forget Him, He reminds them of Himself and of His concern for them. I am near indeed. I answered the prayer of every supplicant when he supplicates to me that divine messengers belong to different spiritual ranks and contribute in different degrees to the fulfillment of the ultimate divine design. The greatest of all messengers is the Holy Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace and the blessings of God. He is the chief of all men, messenger to them all. The revelation he received was addressed to all mankind. The whole of this earth was a mosque for him. Time came when his message spread to the lands and climbs beyond Arabia. People forsook gods of their own conception and began to believe in the one and the only God that the Holy Prophet Muhammad taught them to believe. The coming of the Holy Prophet marked an unparalleled spiritual revolution. Justice began to reign instead of injustice, kindness instead of cruelty. If Moses and Jesus had existed in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, they would have had to believe in him and had to follow him. 8. We also believe that God hears our prayers and helps us out of difficulties. He is a living God, His living character being evident in all things at all times. God continues through them God has revealed His will and His purpose. Those who turn away from them ruin themselves. 
Those who turn to them earn the love and pleasure of God. 7. We also believe that divine messengers belong to different spiritual ranks and contribute in different degrees to the fulfillment of the ultimate divine design. The greatest of all messengers is the Holy Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace and the blessings of God. He is the chief of all men, messenger to them all. The revelation he received was addressed to all mankind. The whole of this earth was a mosque for him. Time came when his message spread to the lands and climes beyond Arabia. People forsook gods of their own conception and began to believe in the one and the only God that the Holy Prophet Muhammad taught them to believe. The coming of the Holy Prophet marked an unparalleled spiritual revolution. Justice began to reign instead of injustice, kindness instead of cruelty. If Moses and Jesus had existed in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, they would have had to believe in him and had to follow him. 8. We also believe that God hears our prayers and helps us out of difficulties. He is a living God, his living character being evident in all things at all times. God continues his benevolent interest in his servants and his creatures. When they need his help, he turns to them with his help. If they forget him, he reminds them of himself and of his concern for them. I am near indeed. I answered the prayer of every supplicantial beam of all our plans. If you really become gods, then rest assured that God is your very own. While you asleep, he will watch over you. While you neglect your vigil against the enemy, he will keep an eye on him and disrupt his plans. Even now, you have no idea what wondrous powers your God has. If you had known, then no day would have dawned on you for you to grieve over the lack of things of this world. A man who has treasure in his possession, does he weep and cry over the loss of a penny, as though he were about to perish? Had you been aware of this treasure that God would suffice for all your needs, what reason was there for you to be so wholly absorbed in the things of this world? God is a most precious treasure. Realize its proper value. Without him you are nothing, neither you nor your material means and plans. Do not follow in the footsteps of other nations which have come to depend wholly on material means. As a snake eats earth, they subsist on the basis of the lower and inferior material means. Like vultures and dogs eating carrion, they too have sunk their teeth in a carcass. Indeed, they have drifted very far from God, having taken to the worship of human beings, the eating of swine's flesh, and the free use of wine as if it were harmless like water. Since they depend too much on material means, and seek no help from God, they are dead, and the heavenly spirit has flown out of them as a dove flies away from its nest. The leprosy of worship of mammon has taken a hold on the inside of their hearts and cut to pieces the organs of their inner spiritual life. Beware ye of this leprosy. I do not forbid you to think of material means within proper limits. What I forbid is that like other nations you become wholly the slaves of material means altogether forgetting God, who controls material means as well. Only if you had the eyes to see, you would find there is only one God and God alone, everything else being worthless. You can neither stretch out your arm nor fold it except with his permission. A person spiritually dead would laugh at this, but it would be better for him if he died before he indulged in this laughter. Beware, do not ape other nations. Beware, having seen other nations, how they have attained a considerable measure of success in their worldly plans, you should not begin to wish to follow in their footsteps. Listen carefully and take heed that they are aliens to and unmindful of that God who calls you to himself. What is their God but a frail human being, this being the reason why they have been left in such a complacent error? I do not wish to stop you from striving for worldly good, but you should not follow the ways of those who think this present world is all in all. In everything you do, whether it pertains to things of this world or of the next, you should seek help and succor from God alone, and this should remain the guiding principle of your life forever and ever. But this seeking of help should not be from your lips alone. It should be your conviction deep down to the bottom of your being that every blessing comes only from heaven. You shall be really righteous only when, at the time of each difficulty, before sitting down to make your plans, you close the door upon yourself and fall down before the throne of God Almighty, crying for His grace and help and succor. Then the Holy Spirit will come to your help, and through unseen means a way shall be opened for you. Have mercy on your own souls, and be not like those who have cut themselves wholly away from God, and have fallen on material means, 
to such extent that to seek divine help they do not even formally utter with their lips the words, If God be willing. May God open your eyes so that you should begin to perceive that your God is the beam on which all plans rest. When the central beam of the roof falls down, can minor supports maintain their position? Most certainly not. They would all come down in an instant, in all likelihood, with much loss of life. In the same way, your plans cannot remain in position without help from God. If you will not cry for his help, if you will not make that soliciting the most fundamental principle of your life, you will have no success and shall die at last with great regret. Do not fall to wondering why other peoples are meeting with success, although they have not the slightest idea of your most perfect and all-powerful God. The answer is this, and this alone, that have forsaken God, they have been put to trial in the matter of material means. Oftentimes a trial from God takes the form that whoever forsakes him, giving himself up to carnal pleasure, setting his mind wholly on material wealth, the doors of worldly advancement are opened upon him, though from the religious and spiritual point of view he is altogether destitute and naked. He dies at last engrossed in this world to be thrown into an eternal hell. Footnote. As a promised Messiah has explained in other places, the expression eternal here means a very, very long period. End footnote. And sometimes this trial takes the form that such a person remains unsuccessful even in the task of amassing wealth. But the latter trial is not so dangerous as the former, since the former breeds an inordinate measure of pride and superiority complex. In any case, both these groups are of those on whom falls the wrath of God. The true fountainhead for all kinds of prosperity is God. Therefore, when these people are unaware of this living and sustaining being, in fact careless in regard to him, and turn their backs upon him, how can real prosperity fall to their lot? Blessed are they who understand this secret, and in dire straits is he who fails to grasp it. Similarly, it is incumbent on you that you do not begin to follow the philosophers of this world. Nor should you suffer yourself to be mentally overawed by them. All these constitute varying manifestations of a gross ignorance. The real and true philosophy is the only one which God has given to you in his holy book. In imminent danger of destruction are the people who have become enamored by these material philosophies. And successful are they who, for real knowledge and philosophy, go to the holy book. Why do you take to the paths of ignorance? Do you run after those who are blind in hope that they will show you the way? O oh, you ignorant people! How can a person show you the way who is himself blind? The truth is that the true philosophy can be obtained only through the Holy Spirit. Through this Spirit you will reach those sciences which are not accessible to others. If you ask for it with sincerity, you will get it at last, and then you will find that this is the only knowledge that imparts freshness and life to the heart, and places it on a firm tower of perfect certainty. How can a man bring forth for you clean and wholesome food, who is himself subsisting on curion? How can one show you the way, who is himself blind? All pure and healthy wisdom comes from the heavens alone. What is this you seek from those who are of this earth? They alone inherit wisdom, whose souls soar to the heavens. Those who are not satisfied in their own minds, how can they give you satisfaction? The foremost thing is purity of heart. Sincerity and purity must come first. After that, you shall get everything. And is open even now. Do not think that the revelation from God is not possible in the future, that it was possible only in the past. Do not think that the Holy Spirit cannot come down now. I tell you truly that every door can be closed, but the door for the coming down of the Holy Spirit. Open all the doors of your heart to receive it. With your own hands, you remove yourself to a distance from that sun, when yourself you close the window through which light can enter. Therefore, get up at once and throw this window open, so that the light of the sun should, of its own accord, enter your heart with the simplicity and inevitability of a natural process. When God has not closed the doors of his blessings upon the world, when in fact he has multiplied them even more than before, do you venture to presume that he has closed upon the doors of his spiritual blessings, even at a time when they were needed most? No, no, not at all. Rather has that door been opened beyond any possible shadow of doubt. Now, in accordance with his teaching as given in the Surah Fatiha, when the door of all earlier blessings has been opened for you, why do you decline to receive them? 
Create a thirst for this spring, and then of itself the water will begin to gush out. For this milk cry like a child, so that it should well up in the breast. Begin to deserve mercy, so that you should be shown mercy. Show anxiety and deep concern, so that your mind should be set at rest. Cry out with pain, again and again, so that a hand should stretch itself and take hold of you. Indeed, how terribly difficult is the way which is the way of the Lord. But verily it is made easy for those who jump into the abyss, resolutely determined to face destruction and death. Blessed are they who, for the sake of the Lord, wage a war against their own selves, while truly ill-starred are they who, for the sake of their baser selves, wage a war against the Lord, and refuse to mold themselves in obedience to his will. Whosoever, for the sake of his own self, evades a commandment of God, he will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Strive therefore to the utmost that not a jot or syllable of the Holy Quran should bear witness against you, and cause you to be apprehended on that account. For indeed, even a single grain of evil is punishable. The time is very short, the mission of your life not yet fulfilled. Walk with speed, for the evening draws nigh. Whatever you have to put before the Lord, examine it well, and as often as you can. Lest some defect remain to cause irreparable loss, or let you take something with you, which in fact should amount to no more than filthy and spurious goods, not worthy to, to be presented at a God right. himself has given the answer. He says, Vasta inu bisabre vasalat, i.e., seek help from God with prayer and perseverance. What is salat? It is a prayer addressed to God in true humility of spirit, and the fullest awareness of his purity, his praiseworthiness, his holiness, coupled with a burning desire on the part of the devotee for divine forgiveness and for blessing on the Holy Prophet. Therefore, when you stand up for prayer, do not, like ignorant people, confine yourself to the prescribed Arabic text. For the prayers and the istighfar of many people is only formal, with no reality in it. When you stand up for prayer, do not, like ignorant people, confine yourself to the prescribed Arabic text. In addition to the prayers found in the Quran, which is the word of God, and in the Hadith, which is the word of the Holy Prophet, address your petitions to the Lord in your own language, with heartfelt humility, which should leave a lasting effect on the mind. In prayer lies the remedy for the coming tribulations. You have no idea what the coming day has in store for you. Therefore, before the day dawns, pray every time that for you it should be a day of blessings and peace. O ye rich and wealthy! O ye who are rich, who are kings, who are millionaires! Among you there are few who fear God and remain truthful and steadfast in all his ways. Most are such that they attach their hearts to the riches of this world, spending all their lives in this preoccupation, without giving any thought to death. Every rich man who does not address himself to God in prayer, whose attitude to God is one of heedlessness, will have on his head the sins of all those who are connected with him. Every rich man who drinks shall have on him the head of sin of all those under him who drink with him. O ye wise! This world will not last forever. Take hold of yourself and be steady. Give up every excess. Leave all intoxicants. Wines, beers, whiskeys, and the like are not the only harmful drinks. Ganja, chars, bhang, tari, and all other intoxicants, the use of which becomes a matter of habit, all have a deadly effect on the brain, and in the end prove fatal. You should keep away from all such things. In fact, we cannot understand at all how and why you take the use of things which, in front of your own eyes, every year prove to be undoing of thousands of people and bringing about their death, while the punishment to come in the hereafter is something quite apart, over and above the disadvantages which go with these things here. Become righteous and God-fearing, so that you should live longer lives, and be blessed by God. Too much indulgence in luxurious easy, irresponsible living is a curse, as it is ill-mannered and heartless to be indifferent to the sufferings of others. Every rich man is as much answerable over the due discharge of his obligations to his creator and his fellow man as a poor man is. In fact, a rich man is even more answerable. Indeed, how unfortunate is he! For the sake of this brief life in this world, who completely turns away from God, who uses forbidden things with such fearlessness as if they were quite lawful, when angry, who raves upon people like a madman, using abusive language, ready to wound and kill, and who, in the pursuit of his lust, becomes shameless in the extreme. Such a one will never know real prosperity. 
My dear people, you are in this world only for a few days, of which a large part is already past. Do not displease your master. Even a temporal government, if displeased with you, can destroy you. Therefore, how much more it behove you not to displease your Creator. No one can destroy you if you are held righteous in the eyes of the Lord. He will himself protect you, and no enemy thirsting for your blood shall be able to harm you. Otherwise, there is no protection for you, and you shall have to live in constant fear of your enemies, uneasy and restless, full of forebodings. And the later days of your lives would pass in great anguish of mind. God himself becomes the protection of those who stand with him. Therefore, come to God and leave off all kinds of opposition to him. Never be negligent in the discharge of obligations he has laid on you. Never oppress his creatures with hand or word of mouth, and always remain in fear of the wrath of heaven, for herein lies the only way to salvation. O ye learned people among the Muslims, do not be hasty in rejecting me as false. There are many profound secrets which man cannot comprehend in a hurry, all at once. You should not be ready to reject a thing the moment you hear it, for this is not the way of the righteous. Had there been no heirs among you, and if you had not interpreted certain hadiths in a manner of contrary to their real sense, then the advent of the Messiah as a judge and adjudicator among you would have been a useless thing. The mission you assigned to this advent, namely, that he would join force with the Mahdi to make war on all in order to forcibly convert them to Islam, is a belief which brings disgrace to Islam. Where at all is it written in the Quran that war is permissible for the sake of spreading one's religion by force? On the contrary, we find Allah saying in the holy book, La ikraha fid deen, i.e., there is no compulsion in matters connected with religion. Then wherefrom would the Messiah, son of Mary, get the right to use force for converting people to Islam? The entire Quran is replete to the effect that there can be no coercion in religion. And it is absolutely clear on the point that when the Holy Prophet وسلم, took up the sword, he did not do so to spread Islam by this means, but, one, as a due punishment for those who had killed a large number of Muslims and had driven out many others from their homes. We read in the Holy Book, Permission has been given to those who fight because they have been oppressed, and Allah indeed has the power to help them in spite of the odds against them. Two, or these wars were defensive, fought against people who were leaving no stone unturned to annihilate Islam and to stop its propagation by four of arms. 3. Or they were fought to assert legitimate freedoms. Apart from campaigns undertaken for these three aims, the Holy Prophet وسلم, and his blessed Khalifas fought no war whatsoever. In fact, before taking up arms in self-defense, Islam bore oppression with silent fortitude to an extent of which there is no example in the history of other peoples. Then what kind of Messiah and Mahdi would these be who would embark on their mission by putting their opponents to the sword right from the start? Gaddi Nashins and Birzadas of the country Similarly, the hereditary heads of the so-called spiritual orders and the peers of this country are so far cut off from Islam, engrossed day and night in their pernicious innovations that they have no idea of the difficult times through which Islam is passing. If you attend their assemblies, instead of the Holy Quran and the Hadith, you will find them bending and swaying over musical instruments and gawalis with numerous bidats in evidence. But in spite of all this, they claim to be religious leaders and followers of the Holy Prophet wasallam. Indeed, anybody and everybody can claim that he loves God, but only he loves God in reality, to whose love heaven itself should bear witness. Everybody claims that he is a follower of the true religion, but the religion of that man alone is true, who obtains light in this very life itself. And everybody says that he will get salvation, but only he is justified in making this claim, who has given light in this earthly life itself. My dear people, this is the time for rendering services to the cause of religion. My dear people, this is the time for serving the cause of the religion you claim to profess. Realize the value of this rare opportunity, for if you let it slip, it will not offer itself to you a second time. Being the followers of such a great and exalted prophet, why do you lose heart? 
Be firm of faith, and set an example that even the angels in heaven should wonder at your strength and steadfastness, and should pray for blessings on you. With this I finish, and pray that this teaching of mine should be fruitful for you, working a change in your hearts which should make you like stars on this earth, filling the globe with the light and life you get from the Lord. Amen. Criterion for Judging Hadith Embracing Prophecies But if there is a Hadith embracing a prophecy which the Muhaddasin has adjudged as weak, while well, in your own time, or at some time earlier than yours, the prophecy contained in that Hadith has been fulfilled, then that Hadith has to be accepted as authentic. And all those who adjudged it weak and failed to accept it, thinking that it was a fabrication, will be held to have been an error. The number of hadiths containing prophecies runs into the hundreds, and most of these have been held by the muhaddasin to be fabricated or defective. Therefore, when one of these is fulfilled and you try to avoid the point, saying that you could not accept it since it was weak, or since this or that narrator in the link through which it had come was not a righteous man, then such a rejection on your part would be due to your faithlessness, for you would be rejecting a hadith of which the reliability had been established by God, even to the extent of fulfillment of the prophecy contained in it. Now suppose there are one thousand hadiths of this kind, held to be weak and unacceptable by the muhaddasin. But suppose the prophecies contained in them come to be fulfilled. Would you reject them, and also reject all the one thousand arguments in support of the veracity of Islam, which the fulfillment of the prophecies in question stood for? If you do anything of the kind, you would become, thereby, enemies of Islam. Allah says, فَلَا يَزْهَرْ أَلَا غَابِهِ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا مَنِرْتَزَى مِنْ رَسُولٍ i.e., he does not reveal his gab, future, except when he chooses to do so to an apostle. Therefore, to whom is a true prophecy to be attributed, if not to a true prophet? Is it not more in accord with one's righteousness of mind to say on such occasions, that the Muhaddasin in question had erred in so far as he had rejected as a weak hadith, which in fact was quite reliable? Or would it be more proper for us to say that in supporting a weak hadith with a testimony of actual events, God himself had been guilty of an error? For you, the guiding principle in any case should be that you should follow even a weak hadith, provided it is not counter to the Holy Quran and the Sunnah, or counter to other hadith in accord with the Holy Book. However, great care is needed on this point. For it is a fact that there exist a large number of fabricated hadiths, which have caused a great deal of disruption in Islam. All the conflicting sects take their stand on this or that hadith, as suits their needs, so that even such a clear and well-established question as of the prescribed obligatory prayers has given rise to extreme differences of view. Some cry Amen in a loud voice, audible to others, while some hold this should be done in one's own mind. Some follow the recitation of the Fatiha by the Imam, with similar simultaneous recitation of the same on the part of the congregation, each in his own mind, while others believe that such recitation spoils one's prayers and is therefore forbidden. Some hold their hands folded on the breast, while others hold them at the navel. The real cause of all these differences lies in the Hadith, i.e., each group being pleased with what it has in its hand. Deliverance from sin lies in perfect conviction. O ye who seek the Lord, open your ears and listen. Take heed that there is nothing like perfect conviction, which delivers you from sin. Conviction gives you the power to do good, and conviction alone can turn you into a lover of God. Can you turn away from evil without perfect conviction? Can you hold your base impulses in check without help of a sure light? Without this perfect conviction, can anyone bring about any real change in himself? Can you attain to any state of satisfaction and peace of mind without this perfect certainty? Can you at all win any real prosperity without it? In the wide world is there any atonement which can give you the power to avoid such sin which man so much stands in need of? Can the fictitious blood of Jesus, son of Mary, deliver you from sin? O you Christians, refrain from uttering a monstrous falsehood, even such as would fain break this earth to pieces. For deliverance, Jesus himself had to depend on perfect conviction. He believed with conviction and was delivered. Woe indeed on those Christians who deceive the world by saying that they have been delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ, even when from head to foot they are drowned in evil. They do not even know who is their God. Their life is one of indulgence and ease. With the intoxication of wine in their head, they remain unaware of the life with God. 
and for them there is no share in the fruits of life as lived in purity. Always remember, therefore, you cannot come out of the darkness without firm conviction, nor can you get the Holy Spirit. Blessed are they who have this conviction, and blessed are they who have been delivered from uncertainties and doubts, for they alone shall be delivered from sin. And blessed will you be when this great treasure of firm conviction is given to you, since on that day sin for you will come to an end. Sin and conviction cannot exist together. Would you ever knowingly put your hand into a hole which you see is occupied by a poisonous snake? Or would you remain standing where a shower of red-hot stones is coming down from some belching volcano? Or which forms the target of the thunderbolt from the skies? Or where a ferocious lion is likely to attack at any moment? Or would you live in a place where a dangerous plague is destroying mankind? Then, if you believe in God with the same firmness of conviction as you believe in the danger from a snake, or a thunderbolt, or a lion, or from a plague, it is not possible that you should defy him by disobedience, to incur punishment thereby, or that you should want to break the bond of sincerity and the loyalty which binds you to him. O ye people, who have been called to righteousness and truth, rest fully assured that the divine attraction will take its birth on you, and you will be washed clean with the ugly blood of sin, only when your hearts become brimful of firm conviction. Perhaps you will say that you have this conviction, but you should take care to remember that this feeling is not more than a delusion on your part. That firm conviction is most certainly not yours, for you do not display the conditions which necessarily must go with it always. You have not yet given up your sinful ways. You have not taken the first step which you ought to have taken the moment this firm conviction became yours. You do not yet fear sin as you should. You can very well think out the question in your own mind. A man never puts his hand into a hole which he knows to be occupied by a poisonous snake, nor does he ever knowingly partake of a food he has reason to believe has been poisoned, nor will he thoughtlessly walk into a thicket of trees which harbors a lion. Then how can your hand and your feet, your eyes and ears, dare to sin when you have the same degree of certainty in regard to the punishment and reward from God on your conduct in life? How in the name of reason can you throw yourself into a fire which you know will burn you to ashes? And always remember that the defensive ramparts built by firm conviction against sin are veritably as high as the heavens, so that Satan cannot scale them to get you after you have once properly built them up. Everyone who is purified is purified through firmness of conviction is conviction which gives you the strength to bear hardships, even to the extent of persuading a king to abdicate his royal throne and take the life of a mendicant. Conviction dissolves all difficulties. Conviction enables a man to see God. All ideas of any atoning sacrifice are false. For every kind of purity comes only from firm conviction. The only thing which delivers a man from sin and advances him in sincerity and steadfastness far ahead of the angels themselves, is conviction and conviction alone. All religions which fail to create this firmness of conviction are false. All religions which fail to show God by means beyond any shadow of doubt are false. And all those religions are false which contain nothing more than a handful of tales and fables about what happened in the past. Do not be satisfied with fables. God exists even now, as he did in days past. His powers too remain the same as they were in the past and he is still capable of showing signs as he was before. Then why should you be satisfied with stories and fables alone? The religion is dead and destroyed, which contains nothing more than stories of miracles shown in the past. And the people are a dead people on whom God does not descend in grace and mercy, whom the divine hand himself has not come down to purify. As a man is drawn towards the joys of this world when he sees its attractions with his own eyes, Similarly, a man drawn towards God when he comes to know with perfect certainty that the spiritual joys are even sweeter. The appeal of divine beauty takes such a hold on his mind that everything else appears to him of no more value than mere trash. Man is freed from sin only when he comes to know of the power of God and of divine retribution on the basis of a firm conviction. Ignorance is the root of every fearlessness, and no one will ever be found devoid of the fear of God, even to the least extent who partakes of divine knowledge. When a householder knows a dangerous flood is advancing on his house, or that it has been surrounded by a fire on all sides, he will at once flee from it. Then how can you dare to leave your ways of life unaltered after your belief in the existence of God? In divine retribution and reward has hardened into a film unshakable conviction. Therefore, open your eyes and carefully study the law of God operating in the universe. Do not be like rats, which only go digging and descending down into the earth. Be like a dove, capable of flying into the heavens, which feels happy only when it is flying in the pure air of the loftier regions. After taking the bath of repentance at my hand, take 
take care of what you do not remain unaltered in your former sinful ways. Do not be like a snake that remains as much of a snake after it has shed its skin as it ever was before. Remember death, which approaches you every moment, though you remain unaware. Do your best to purify yourself, for a man can attain nearness to what is purity par excellence only when himself he becomes pure, as far as possible. The way to attain purity is prayer offered in true humility of spirit. But the most important question is the of the Holy Quran. I have been given to understand that among you there are some who altogether reject the Hadith. If this is so, then these people are in manifest error. I have never taught that they should hold such views. Quite to the contrary, I hold very firmly that for your guidance God has provided three things. The foremost among these is the Holy Quran, which sets forth the unity of God, His grandeur and greatness, and decides all points in dispute between the Jews and the Christians. Further, the Quran forbids that you worship anything other than God, neither man nor beast, the sun nor the moon, nor any other heavenly body, nor material means, nor your own selves. Therefore, beware! Do not take a single step in contravention of anything contained in the holy book. Verily, I tell you truly that whosoever evades, even in the least of the seven hundred commandments embodied in the holy Quran, he slams shut the door of salvation upon himself. The real and perfect paths of salvation have been opened only by the holy Quran. All others were only its shadows. Therefore, you should study this holy scripture with the utmost attention and deepest thought, and you should love it, as you have never loved anything else, for indeed as God has conveyed to me. Al Khairo Gullahu fil Quran i.e. all the good lies in the Quran. All kinds of good are to be found in it, and this is the truth. Unfortunate indeed are the people who give preference to other things over it. The Holy Quran is the fountainhead for your salvation, for all betterment and success. There is not even a single spiritual need which has not been met for you in this holy book. The supporter or falsifier of your faith on the day of judgment would be the holy Quran. And apart from this book, there is no other under the heavens which can provide you with direct guidance. It is indeed a great blessing of God upon you that he has bestowed on you a book like this. Verily, I tell you truly that the book which has been read upon you, had it been read upon the Christians, they would not have perished. And the blessings and the guidance which have been vouchsafed to you, had it been extended to the Jews in place of the Torah, many of their sects would not have ended by denying the day of judgment. Realize, therefore, the value of the blessing bestowed on you. It is a precious blessing and a great treasure. Without the Holy Quran, the whole world would have been no better than a dirty clot of half-formed flesh. Indeed, it is a book as compared to which all other scriptures and sources of guidance amount to nothing at all. The Holy Quran can purify man within a week, provided there is no attempt to get away from it in form or spirit. The Quran can make you like the prophets, provided you do not try yourself to run away from it. Apart from the Holy Quran, what book is there at the very outset which has taught its readers a prayer like this? Edna siratil mustaqim siratil lazina anamta alayhim i.e. Guide us to the right path, the path of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy blessings, and hast thus held out to them a great hope, namely, the hope of the way being shown to them, which would lead them to the attainment of those blessings which were bestowed on those who were prophets, the Sadiqs, the Shohada, and the Salim. Therefore, elevate your resolve, and do not reject this invitation of the Quran when it calls you to work for attainment of the blessings given to the earlier peoples. God, in fact, is inclined to bestow on you even more. God has made you inherit all their spiritual and material substance. But until the day of the Gerama, these will not pass away from you to anyone else. God will not keep you deprived of the blessing of revelation and of the tangible forms of communion generally spoken of as Mughalmat and Mohatabat. He will consummate all those blessings on you which he ever bestowed on others. But whosoever, by way of insolence, shall lie and shall claim to have received revelation from him, when in fact he has received no such revelation, or claim that he had the honor of communion with God of the kind called Mughalmat and Mohatabat, when in fact no such honor has been bestowed upon him, then with God and all his angels as my witness, I declare that one shall perish and be destroyed for having lied about his creator and having perpetrated a fraud. The explanatory position of the Sunnah. The second instrument for guidance vouchsafed to the Muslims is the Sunnah, 
i.e., the measures adopted by the Holy Prophet with a view to the exposition of the Holy Quran and its being put into actual tangible practice. For instance, looking at the surface only, there appears to be no specification in the Quran of Rakats in the case of the five daily obligatory prayers. How many for what prayer? But the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet has made all of these things very clear. No one should fall into the error that the Hadith and the Sunnah are one and the same thing. For what is called the Hadith came to be collected a hundred and fifty years afterwards, while the Sunnah existed from the very outset side by side with the Holy Quran. After the Holy Quran, the greatest debt of gratitude the Muslims owe to anything is to the Sunnah. The obligation on God and His Apostle in regard to the guidance of mankind was only twofold, namely, that by sending down the Holy Book, God indicated by means of His Word, His will, and pleasure in the fulfillment of the demand inherent in the divine law, while the duty which devolved upon the holy prophet was this that by putting it into actual practice, he should clearly demonstrate it in all aspects in an actual operation. Therefore, he transformed into action what had been said in the form of words, and by his actual practice solved a number of difficulties. It is not proper to say that this duty devolved upon the Hadith since Islam has established itself upon the earth long before the Hadith came to be collected. Did not the people offer their prayers at the time when the Hadith had not yet been collected? Did they not pay the zakat or perform the hajj? Or were they ignorant as to what was permissible for them and what was not? Supportive Position of the Hadith Of course, the third means of guidance is the Hadith, because many points in regard to history, ethics, and jurisprudence are to be found explained fully in it, and the great utility of the Hadith lies in the fact that it is a servant of the Quran and the Sunnah. Some people who are ignorant as to the real position of the Holy Quran here assign to Hadith the position of a judge on the Quran, as did the Jews in regard to some of their traditions. We, on the other hand, look upon the Hadith as a servant of the Quran and the Sunnah. The existence of servants being in no way derogatory to the Master being in fact a sign of his importance and grandeur. The Holy Book is the Word of God, while the Sunnah is the act of the Holy Prophet, the Hadith being a supporting witness for the Sunnah. It is wrong to say, God forbid, that the Hadith is a judge on the Holy Quran. If there is any judge on the Holy Quran, it is the Holy Book itself. The Hadith, which in any case has an element of speculation in it, cannot be given a superior position, being no more than a supporting argument. The Quran and the Sunnah have done all the real work, the Hadith doing no more than supplying some additional verification. How can the Hadith be in the position of a judge for the Holy Quran? The Holy Book and the Sunnah were extending guidance to mankind at a time when as yet there was no sign of the so-called judge. Therefore, never say that the Hadith is a judge on the Holy Quran. Say rather that the Hadith supplies further supportive evidence for the Quran and the Sunnah. Of course, the Sunnah, undoubtedly, is a thing which indicates the will of the Quran, and it signifies the path on which the Holy Prophet put his companions. The Sunnah is not a name for the things which came to be written and collected a hundred or a hundred and fifty years afterwards. These are called the Hadith. The Sunnah, on the other hand, is the practical example that has, from the very earliest beginning, existed all along in the practical actions of Muslims, their number extending to thousands as the most conservative estimate. But even though in a great part of it the Hadith occupies the position of a speculation, still, where it does not run counter to the Holy Quran, it deserves to be accepted. Serving as a supporter for the Holy Quran and the Sunnah, with a large storehouse of material bearing on many Islamic questions. Failure to appreciate the Hadith, therefore, is a tantamount to cutting away a large part of the body of Islam. But of course, if a Hadith falls counter to the Holy Quran and the Sunnah, and counter to the other hadiths which are in record with the holy book or stands in opposition to the sahih bukhari it should not be acceptable for acceptance thereof would imply rejection of the holy quran and of those hadiths which stand in accord with the holy book i am satisfied that no righteous person would want to subscribe to such belief in any case give due recognition to hadiths and derive benefit from it to the fullest possible extent for they come from the Holy Prophet, and unless they are rejected by the Quran and the Sunnah, you should not reject them. 
you should adhere to the Hadith to such an extent that no action of yours, no pause, no performance, and no failure to perform any work should be without basis in Hadith. But if there is a Hadith which stands in contradiction of what has been stated in the Quran, you should exercise your mind to reconcile it in interpretation. But where no such reconciliation is possible, the Hadith should be rejected and thrown aside, since it cannot be taken to have come from the Holy Prophet. But if there is a weak Hadith which stands nevertheless in accord with the Holy Quran, it is to be accepted.